So I'm here today with Jay, and uh, we're going to have a really interesting conversation about many things, because from, from what I see of Jay's background, he's kind of a polymath, interested in just about everything. But by background, he's an electrical engineer, information systems designer, business founder and owner, photographic artist in training. You can see all his cameras there in the background. He's a car and motorcycle enthusiast and interested in psychology, neuroscience, and cooking. And as a retired Christian, he says he loves the woods, he loves America, and he loves the Lord. So I think we're going to have some interesting things to talk about. So, Jay, I always like to learn a little bit about the people that I talk to. I wonder if you could tell me a little bit about how you grew up. I, I know you live in Georgia now. Have you always lived in Georgia? Oh, no. Uh, by the way, Vicki just showed up. Scoot on over. No, no, I'll stay, I'll stay right okay, here. She, okay, she'll sit in the sidelines, but we, there's two of us here, Karen. Okay, that's fine. Uh, Karen, uh, let's see. What about? I just first want to thank you for uh, this opportunity to chat. Uh, I was a long, you know, I think I've watched everything that Jordan Peterson and Paul Vander Clay and the the whole group that we both follow uh, have published and being retired and living alone, it gives me just a, a freedom to uh, spend as much time on whatever interests me uh, as I like. And so I feel, uh, I think uh, I might have said in something that I wrote to you, uh, sometimes it's hard to find folks that you can really communicate with. And, one of your recent videos, I heard you describing how you sometimes thought you might be a little weird because of the way your mind worked. And that's the first time I learned uh, the concept of process mind or process thinking. And I've always had that same problem. So it was, a, it was nice to run into you. So anyway, I was uh, born in East Tennessee. Uh, unlike Elizabeth Warren, I've got some real Cherokee in me. I'm not sure whether it's... Uh, a 16th or a 32nd because we can't verify the exact uh, makeup of my uh, great grandmother. But um, uh, so I'm Native American, probably more Native American blood than anything else, and the rest all kinds of Northern European, well, from Italy all the way through uh, France, England, uh, Germany. Okay, I. Uh, I went to the University of Tennessee and from there to NYU uh, and my first job, which was probably one of the kind of things that all young engineers would like to do. I was lucky enough to uh, be accepted by Bell Telephone Laboratories, which as I'm sure you're aware is uh, one, was and still is one of the premier engineering institute or uh, I guess, yeah, I'd say electrical, electrical engineering communications uh, laboratories in the world. And it was so rich as a uh, young kid right out of the country. Well, not really. Knoxville's not actually the country. Uh, to be able to go to a place like that where, uh, you know, my first desk was the desk of Harry Nyquist, who was a legend in electrical engineering. It was really cool to be able to walk down the hall and run into some of the real leaders like Claude Shannon, who was the information theory guru and the inventors of the transistor and stuff like that. So it was really nice. Uh, but anyway, from there, my career took me uh, uh, through uh, corporate America and some of the larger corporations with uh, primarily a government, uh, military, satellite, uh, telemetry, ground communications, command and control, all those kind of buzzwords. Uh, and, you know, I always longed to escape. So I did escape and ended up in the computer business, computer store business, actually, as a minority owner uh, in North Carolina, and then started my own company, which was a software systems engineering design company. It just had a lot of fun for a few years. I would say the uh, the pinnacle of my career, and I would say I could probably have died at that point and felt completely fulfilled. I was fortunate enough to be able to recruit both of my children uh, straight out of college. 
um, and had them for seven years, one for three years and one for seven. I'm sorry, one for four and one for three. And it was just a wonderful experience to get to, uh, to know your kids and to, uh, I think, learn a little bit about parenting because even though I was in my 40s at the time, I had 40s or early 50s, um, I saw so many things in those kids that I really couldn't explain how they got it, except that it came from uh, myself and their mother. And how it got there, I don't know, but uh, it was just one of those things where you could sit down in the evening and rub your chin and say, my God, where'd those kids get that? And aren't they so cool? So that's me, Karen. That's me, Karen. Uh, I uh, found JP and actually returned to Christianity through the biblical series. Um, I had just all, I had been in all kinds of denominations and all kinds of beliefs uh, from the time I was a kid growing up as a Southern Baptist on through to teaching Sunday school in a Methodist environment and, and uh, spent many, many years with the Unitarians and, and, and the uh, and the Unity folks. And uh, so anyway, I, I'm back to, uh, like I don't think any church could stand me because of my views. That's what I tell them is if they try to recruit me. And, but I still have some uh, really close uh, pastor friends at, here locally and being in the middle of the Bible Belt here in North Georgia in the mountains, uh, it's really wonderful because I get to see their views up hand and have really good quality discussions with them. So I'll shut up and let me just say a word about Vicki who doesn't want to be seen. Uh, one of the problems I've always had is one of listening. And I noticed in watching your video uh, and watching uh, the other people who are so effective, Paul and, and uh, uh, John Verveke, and, and uh, especially John Verveke and Paul, they are, I would call them power listeners. And uh, my gosh, I, and I see you and your, your skill set, and, and I say, I better get some help or I'll be long lost. So Vicki agreed to, uh, to tutor me in listening. <laughs> I won't ask you what I won't tell you what I asked her to do if she couldn't get my attention, but she declined. <laughs> She's recently retired. Uh, a, a, re, a recent grandmother of about three weeks ago was it? Well, no, we're at six. Weeks. Six weeks ago, uh, her daughter's down in Houston, all cooped up. Uh, Vicky and her husband Kenny, who are close friends, they're actually my landlord or landlords, I, I, I would say, I don't know who's the boss, but anyway, I love them both. <laughs> and uh, we, we, uh, we've been together, well, so, oh, five or six years now. And anyway, uh, she was not, and they were not able to go down for that birth. And it was really devastating to them. And I'm, I'm kind of speaking out of turn, so she can hit me if I say too much, but uh, it's a really close family. Uh, in the North Georgia or in the Georgia tradition and in the Christian tradition. And early on when I came, they kind of took me under their wing and being an old man living alone and sometimes uh, needing somebody to talk to. It's just been a, uh, it's been a heaven sent to me or a God sent or whatever, because the, the worst thing I could think of is having to leave these beautiful mountains and the access to the, to the wilderness that, that I have, there's something like 300 miles of trails within a 20 mile radius, several lakes and several waterfalls. And anyway, I'm talking on too much. So, so Vicki's here and uh, uh, a wonderful woman, wonderful brain, uh, a reader extraordinary. And uh, I'll say no more and turn it back to you, Karen. Well, I, I'm here to listen. <laughs> um, the, I think my listening skills just improved immensely from watching Jordan Peterson. And I'm not sure he's a very good listener because he talks an awful lot. <laughs> but, but he does talk a lot about how important it is to attend. That attending is almost like a superpower because when you actually attend to what a person is saying, it changes you and it changes them because 
that's where the real learning takes place. And um, and I just want to pop in here with a little uh, little thing, you know. For those out there who are Christians, a, a very wonderful Christian just died the night before last, and that would be Rabbi Zacharias. And he was a great, great Bible teacher and great enthusiast of the message of Christ. And I was reading his obituary this morning, and there was this very interesting thing in there about how in 1983, Billy Graham asked Rabbi Zacharias to speak to a group of evangelists and pastors. And this is what Zacharias said that day. He said, my, very, my message is a very difficult one. And he went on to tell them that religions, 20th century cultures and philosophies had formed vast chasms between the message of Christ and the mind of man. Even more difficult was his message, which received a mid-talk ovation about his fear that in certain strands of evangelicalism, we sometimes think it is necessary to so humiliate someone of a different worldview that we think unless we destroy everything he holds valuable, we cannot preach to him the gospel of Christ. What I am saying is this, when you are trying to reach someone, you must be sensitive to what he holds valuable. People aren't logical problems waiting to be solved. They are people who need the person of Christ. He saw the objections and questions of others not as something to be rebuffed, but as a cry of the heart that had to be answered. And uh, that's the kind of thing I've been trying to learn that, and, and certainly because I don't have all the answers. I don't have any answers. <laughs> The only answer I have is that, that I believe that Christ is the center of everything. And uh, beyond that, I'm just a, an eager learner. And so that, that's made me an eager listener. And like you, I've watched just about everything there is online of Jordan Peterson's. And I try to keep up with Paul Vander Clay, but that's a fool's errand. <laughs> just no way to do that. So. But Jay, you got in touch with me because you had some interesting ideas about cosmology and, uh, and I thought it would be interesting to explore what it is that you are, what it is that you're thinking about. I mean, if you don't want to go into that right now, that's fine too, but um, maybe you could just tell me the kinds of things that you, the kinds of trails that you like to follow. You really know how to cut to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to wander through some fields for a while, we can do that too. <laughs> oh, well, I'm not sure we could do that. It'd probably <clears throat> blow some people's minds. <laughs> um, you know, you mentioned uh, Paul's uh, Paul being prolific. I think I told you the other day in an email, in, in, in accurately, that he had had a, a, a newsletter what I was misleading for about 10 or 12 email messages at one time from him <laughs> were links to, uh, to uh, he's got a, he must have an automated system that he can easily forward links to stuff to people. And in fact, uh, did you see this morning the um, testimony of our new press secretary? What's her name? Um, you know that uh, nice looking Kaylee, Kaylee McEnany? Yeah, she did a about a 10 minute or a five minute online obituary of Ravi Zacharias. And she oh, was no, in I tears. Didn't, I didn't see that. Uh -uh. Paul sent that out this morning and I saw it right before we started here. It's really moving. And um, turns out that the, he was like uh, one of her real hero, heroes. and. I think, as I recall, she, he might have been the reason that she, no, no, she grew up in a Christian environment, but he was, she was either, uh, I don't remember the details of how she came involved, but I would certainly recommend that anyone uh, watching this uh, take a look at that. It's, it's moving. Okay, well, why, why did I reach out to you? Um, well, first of all, 
before we get into that, I've just got to ask you something because I, I need to ask it before we run out of time. The thing that fascinated me in two or three people that I've talked with about your story was the way you described how you did art and this idea of being able to erect beauty from chaos, which I think is absolutely fundamental to the Christian story. And I haven't, and we can go into that. It, it, that's more along the line of Matthew uh, uh, Peugeot, Jonathan's brother, and his book, the name I forget, but central to that is the idea of, uh, and, and central to Jordan's message, and central to the Eastern Eastern thought. Uh, the yin yang thing is the is the idea of, of uh, chaos and order, and um, the picture that he points, that's Matthew Peugeot points to in his book, which I'd also recommend to anyone listening. Uh, the is language, the idea of that the language of creation is called the lang the language of creation. Okay, it 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 it's, it just blew me away when I saw uh, the the idea of ancient cosmology compared to modern cosmology in the with respect to time, and because I've had a thought for quite some time that in order to really understand the Bible. Uh, we need. We would need to understand the way the people to whom the Bible was written uh, thought about the universe, which is essentially cosmology. So I did a bit of a, and so that when I learned about uh, uh, Matthew's book, which had not been published at the time he and Jonathan talked about it, it was sub subsequently published. I, I was able to get a copy on a Kindle copy pretty much as soon as it came out. But as soon as I read in there the story of Adam and Eve from a, from a graphical, uh, ancient cosmological standpoint, and the story of chaos and order, uh, and the story of, of chaos being time, chaos is time, and order being the garden, and the, the concept that time was causative uh, in that cosmology, according to Matthew. And the, the thing that just blew my mind when I heard that was that we Westerners and every mathematician, every physicist, every bi uh, biologist you will listen to today will think of time not as causative, but they will think of time as observ uh, of observing time. So when you get into the, the, the modern concepts that are starting to emerge, uh, there's, there's got to be some kind of tie-in between this change of cosmology that occurred uh, after the time of Aristotle and those arguments between Platonism and, and Aristotle's ideas and how that led to the Western view. So um, I, I really thank you for, and I'm sure I don't live up to that comment you made calling me a polymath. For one, I'm not a professor, so I don't think I could qualify. But at any rate, uh, I think understanding more about ancient cosmology and then uh, understanding how that's that how today's cosmology affects our thoughts and uh, and not just our thoughts it's the thoughts of all science and engineering and all of the modern technology uh, it's modern cosmology now here's what's happening I believe uh, there seems to be a transition being made in the minds of some of the uh, some of the scientists and some of the uh, some of the philosophers and it, 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 it's been coming for the last 10 20 years and uh, in fact uh, i forget i think it, his name's hill the he's a researcher from cambridge who's on one of the teams at uh, cern the large hadron uh, collider he did a ted talk about two years ago talking about how the modern view of particle physicists is that they don't think of particles anymore. They're thinking of, uh, they're thinking of waves and they're thinking of, uh, so this idea of an, of an, of a atom being a proton and a neutron surrounded by these things that whiz around called electrons. 
from a particle standpoint, those ideas have, are giving way in the scientific community and the, actually in the, in the uh, physics community among some of the, uh, uh, the, the younger, uh, newer super intellects. And, and so we're, we're at the cusp of a change is what he says. And I think we're seeing that uh, uh, in several fields. So I'll shut up with, with that, Karen, and turn it back to you. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned time because that's a lot of what, um, what I've been noticing in those that are trying to springboard some new theories. It all wraps around this idea of time. Some of them say now that time doesn't actually exist. Some of them say that time is, um, that all time is always here, which, I mean, that's, that's certainly the biblical view that, that God is outside of time and that time is a composite, is, is a whole. Um, so, yeah, I think a lot of physicists are grappling with this whole idea of time and how that fits with anything, especially when they start talking about multidimensional theories, because where does time fit into that, you know? Yeah, well, you know, uh, I, I, I think I heard you once say that you felt pain for Jordan because he couldn't really cross the divide between his concept of uh, of acting like he believed in God, I think, as compared to believing in God. Well, He's... Only, only because of only because of the magnitude of the suffering that he goes through, and I've I've gone through some suffering in my life, and if I hadn't had the Lord walk with me through that, if I hadn't known that the Lord was walking with me through that, I don't know if I would have made it. So. I just think about the suffering that he's in. I mean, on the other side of it, I fully understand why he stands astride that, that line um, because it certainly makes his message have a wider reach than it would otherwise. Oh, boy, that is, that is an excellent observation. Um, in, in fact, I kind of feel like... Uh, that's the biggest problem that these that that today's scientists and, and and engineers, I would say, probably the scientists more than the engineers, because the engineers just don't have time to uh, to dig down into all the details of all the silos of knowledge that are necessary to do engineering, because the engineers are always faced with a timeline have, of having to produce something. And if they don't produce something, if it doesn't work, they don't get paid. And so many of our physicists and, and professors and folks that are paid to think, they don't, they don't have to produce anything except thought. <laughs> and so that kind of gives the engineers an advantage. They say, well, we might not know what God is exactly, but we know enough to be able to build a bridge. Yeah. Yeah, that's certainly true. That um, and and one of the things I've noticed is that the um, com the field of computer engineering. There are quite a few people in that field who recognize the issue with probabilities um, wrapped around a lot of these questions, and because of their capacity to understand um, computer logic and and probabilities and numbers and and all of those things they begin grappling with these massive probability problems in uh, in the whole issue of evolution and the issue of um, the structure of the first book of the bible and things like that even from the outside of christianity when they're looking at these things they're saying there's something here that needs to be looked at, but the those in the well, I've talked to quite a few physics too, physicists too in the physics realm who recognize that the problems that are there. But 
of course, the problem is that the minute you stick your head up and acknowledge that you're grappling with these problems, you're all of a sudden persona non grata in the, in the scientific community. And Eric Weinstein is looking at that from the other side, recognizing that the opportunity for grand new ideas has really become diminished by the peer review process and the, the uh, just the need for funding, the need to knuckle under so that you can get your grant funding or so that you can get your tenure in the university. All of those things are preventing people from really seeking truth. And of course, that's what Jordan Peterson talks about all the time, that truth is of the absolute essence. Well, um, let's see, you said so much, so many rabbit, what you call them bunny paths that we could go down. <laughs> But I'll try to refrain. Let's go back to what you said about probability. Okay. I tend to, to go along with uh, Einstein's uh, thought in that area. And I think, he, I think there's a statement attributed to him that says God didn't play probability or God didn't believe in chance or something like that in his critique of quantum mechanics. Yeah. So, but, that, but that's because, from what I understood, that um, when Einstein said that, he was unwilling to accept the the finding of the uh, cosmic background radiation idea that springboarded the whole concept that there had been a beginning. He didn't want to accept that there had been a beginning. He didn't want to accept that um his theory led to that possibility and so that that's why he said that right um i'm not sure um i don't know enough about quantum mechanics and quantum theory and einstein to know uh to know why he said that or, or what part of quantum mechanics that had to do with but i, I guess i would say that uh in the vein of quantum theory and, and the study in, in quantum mechanics and what's going on in the scientific world today as these folks struggle and struggle to continue to get their funding in order to conduct their experiments trying to prove dark matter which seems to be unprovable and trying to prove all kinds of things uh, let, let me see if I can be I'm going to get off on a bunny trail that's the hole I'll fall in. So let me back up for a minute. Um, I think that that um, and it, that it could be that 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 when people are when they when people dig into probability, that that's just another that's just another way to avoid the realization that uh, there's things out there that human beings being a part of the system the system being the universe and being such a small part of the system that there's a certain arrogance in all humans that says i'm able to understand the whole and if i can make this beautiful equation or do this experiment that gets really close that uh, i really do know how the universe is made or i can come closer to how the universe is made and whereas um, in the 19th century the um, mathematicians and physicists came up with what was called um, a table of constants i believe or a book of constants that was distributed to all of us engineers so we could make the equations balance properly i think that book is uh, all of those quote unquote acceptable constants for all of the uh, proper equations i think that book is kept somewhere in uh, in england by some board that keeps up with what's reality and what's truth and um, by having those constants our mathematicians were able to make all of this beauty in math which is unbelievably beautiful from schrodinger's equations 
right on to the, the wave equations in quantum mechanics. They could use all these constants to make the equations balance. But in fact, uh, those constants aren't always constants. Uh, in fact, two or three years ago, I think a law was passed in England that said, from now on, the speed of light will be this, because there had been, the speed of light had been changing in the book of constants for a number of years. And like, people just were starting to scratch their head. How could this be the book of constants if the speed of light keeps changing? <laughs> So I think the whole problem is that, that, uh, that if you look at it from an electrical engineer standpoint or from an electric, electric universe standpoint, uh, there's a, uh, an equation that we all learn in the first year of engineering. It's called uh, the Fourier transform. And it's F equals one over T, uh, which is frequency equals one over time. Now the problem is that equation blows up when the denominator is zero, like all equations blow up. And, um, and so then if you, if you take the fact that if it didn't blow up and if you could have negative time, you could have negative frequency and that doesn't make any sense or does it? And see, that's really the question or does it? Because if in fact we look at the, the spectrum, and we look at the at the spectrum from the from the spectral spect, spectral size of our senses, the the five senses that that us humans have to perceive the real world. That's a part of the spectrum, but that spectrum, but it is like a grain of sand on the beach compared to all the frequencies that are available. So. Uh, if, if, if we limited beings are trying to construct a set of symbols, the symbols of mathematics, to make our beautiful equations, and we can't accept that we're such a small, minute part and that we really perhaps don't even have the capability to understand God, understand the Creator, understand the whole, understand the, the infinite. If, we, if we're so arrogant that we have that as our are the basis for all of our science, then man, when somebody comes, comes and starts talking about uh, God <laughs> and the unknown and the creator of all, and we, and we can't figure out how to put it in our equations or in our, our math books or in our science books, we get really, really scared, especially if that's how we make our living. Okay, I'll shut up. I've got way too much on a soapbox with that statement. Well, I, I think it's really interesting because uh, you reminded me the other day to go back and re-listen to some David Berlinski. I listened to a lot of David Berlinski last year, but I hadn't listened to it recently. So I went back and listened to a couple of his talks. And uh, he told one very interesting story. He, he was talking about, um, I think the name was Alfred Wallace, who was a... a uh, biologist about the same time as Charles Darwin, who had actually come up with the theory of evolution before Darwin did. But he never wrote his book because he saw a glitch that he just couldn't make his way through. And so he never wrote the book because he felt that there was a flaw in the theory of evolution that just didn't make sense to him. And the flaw that he saw was that if you went up into a you know, mountainous region, isolated tribal group, maybe cannibals up in South America or, you know, some tribe in, the, in Borneo or in Africa someplace that had never had any contact with civilization. So from time immemorial, it had been a primitive tribe. You could take one of those babies and you could put them in Oxford you could take them as a baby at age six months, raise them up in a family in England, send them to Oxford, and they might end up being a world-class physician or a world-class pianist or a world-class dancer. Um, they could become any number of things. And he said, if, if evolution by natural selection were true, 
then there would be absolutely no need for that group of skills to be in those people where it was never ever utilized because they had no civilization, they had no access to pianos or doctors or colleges or you know any 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 of those intellectual pursuits or any of those um, areas of talent were just unnecessary. So he couldn't see how evolution would have produced that in those tribes that were isolated from civilization, while at the same time, these tribes that ended up becoming civilized and feeding into Western civilization has that same set of tools. And he, he said it, it looked to him as though humans have a set of untapped gifts inside. And so when Berlinski was talking about this, I'm thinking untapped gifts, that is such an interesting way to look at it because not only is every human being born with this capability to become almost anything, um, there are a set of principles wrapped around those untapped gifts as well. So, so there's untapped gifts inside the human, but then there's also untapped gifts outside the human. So all these discoveries that are made by physicists and mathematicians and scientists and biologists and everything else, those are the untapped gifts that are sitting out there in the world just waiting to be discovered. And they're everywhere, they're all around us not to mention just the beauty that's all around us that's an untapped gift that you may not even notice if your eyes aren't open. But the untapped gifts inside the individual require, you know, you, you showed me a picture of a certain structure of the universe that, that has kind of an X in the center of it. And I think that this X configuration is very important at every level. You know, the the cosmological level, but also at just the level of living a human life, that life is lived in what uh, the biblical scholars call a chiastic structure. When they look at the structure of um, the literature in the Bible, or even the, the stories of the patriarchs in the Bible, there's a structure where their life starts out fairly broad. They go through situations, suffering, disciplinary actions that constrict their life, narrow it down until it becomes very difficult and painful. They go through this knot kind of in the middle of their life. And then from the other side, their, their potential opens up and their, their authority, their opportunity for authority and all of that opens up. So it's this chiastic structure. It's this X kind of a thing. And um, I think untapped gifts are like that. You, you have maybe this interest in playing the piano. And so you might mess around with it a little bit, but maybe you know something, maybe you don't know something, but it doesn't ever turn into anything until you put in those 10,000 hours of really hard work and discipline to hone that skill. And you go down into this hard knot where you have to really apply yourself in order to open up and then be, be able to have an opportunity to have the freedom to move out in this skill. A physical prowess is the same way. It requires a lot of hard discipline to develop that physical prowess. And so untapped gifts are useful when we apply ourselves. <laughs> Not so much if we don't, you know. There are some few people that might be born with an untapped gift that, that they never have to put any effort into, but I don't think so. Well, I, along, along those lines, you might, uh, I think I watched that same Berlinski video. Yeah. And at the end of it, there was a question, if it's the same video from one of the uh, people in the audience. This was the one, I think, that was presented at Socrates in New York City. Um, well, I watched several. Yeah, it might have been that one. Yeah. Well, anyway, the, the, the answer, to the question was about Darwinism. And the final part of the question was, do you believe in, in, in the theory of evolution by Darwin? Mm -hmm. what, what do you guess Berlinski's answer was to that question? 
I can't remember his exact answer. I remember he was scornful. It was actually a very short answer. It was no. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. the person kind of said, you mean not anything? He said, nothing. He said nothing else that went on to the next question. The guy is so effective on stage, I couldn't believe it. Yeah, of course, some people just say he's an angry old crank, but, but he's <laughs> wonderful to listen to. Absolutely. Well, anyway, you mentioned untapped gifts. I would love to see him have a conversation with Jordan Peterson. Oh, that poor would, Jordan, you know. Uh, because, because Berlinski is very opposed to evolutionary psychology, and Jordan Peterson is all about evolutionary psychology. So they well, just did a beautiful conversation. Well, you see, I, I think that's part of, of Jordan's suffering. Uh, when you think of suffering being all the cognitive dissonance that is generated within us, when we as humans can recognize that, that we're not really right and there's something that's more right on the other side of the wall, but we just don't have the courage to go through the wall because for, there's something about us psychologically internal that protects us from pain. And if, and, if we, and if whatever that is inside sees that that's going to be such pain, it prevents us from going there. And that, so, so, I think, so I think that uh, the, the, someone who really does believe in, in evolution uh, is going to have a hard time uh, accepting uh, Christianity and therefore a hard time accepting the truth of the ultimate, uh, I, I would say the ultimate truth of the, of, the, of the universe and all that's in it. Well, so, um, how do I put this? Um, I've had major, major questions about evolution for, well, I became a Christian in 1980. And shortly thereafter, I, I started getting, I, I was already 30 years old at the time, 32 years old at the time. And shortly afterwards, I started studying as much as I could about a lot of things. And I started really looking into evolution, reading a lot of books and trying to understand um, what it was all about. And, and the story has changed over the years, the, the various scientists who, um, try to fill all the gaps in the theory, the stories have changed. I remember one big story back when I was looking into it back in about 1982 was from Stephen Gould, Stephen J. Gould. And his idea was that even though there were no transitional forms or very few transitional forms that they could find in the fossil record, he had this idea that maybe it was something he called punctuated equilibrium, that, that uh, one, type of creature like maybe an amphibian would lay an egg and then that when that egg hatched it was no longer an amphibian now it was a chicken and that the, and that therefore these jumps took place all at once along the path and when i read that i just thought that is absolutely ludicrous um anyway this the stories are always changing because they're always trying to fill the gaps on the other hand um, when I listen to someone like Jordan Peterson or Brett Weinstein talk, I have no problem whatsoever following their train of thinking and understanding completely why they believe the way they do. And there's a part of my mind that can handle both of those tracks and say, okay, Whichever way God did it, I'm fine with that because God is God and he's a lot bigger than I am. So I have no problem with that. Um, there are problems when you get down to Adam and Eve. There's a, there's a major problem there. <laughs> that, and that's got to be part of Jordan Peterson's cognitive dissonance because <clears throat> he has very, very crystal ideas about Adam and Eve and, and uh the kind of evolution he believes in doesn't really make a path for that. But um, I can talk with an evolutionist and 
feel perfectly fine talking with them and not feel any need whatever to debate them on what they believe. Because to me, that is not really the central issue. Um, I think the central issues are outside of that. But um, I know there's a lot of people who disagree with me about that. But then when I listen to an evolutionist like Jordan Peterson, and he goes on, on and on, or, or Brett Weinstein, and they talk about, you know, this evolved because of that, and the way we, we act this way because that evolved and everything. None of evolution is not necessary whatsoever to support any of those things that they're talking about. Any of their ideas of um, what happened that created a certain um, certain physical characteristic that we have or a certain psychological characteristic, which they attribute to evolution, could just as easily be attributed to special creation of God. So evolution is like not a necessary thing in order to understand all of the scientific truths and principles that that Jordan Peterson and Brett Weinstein teach. But because their lens is evolution, they see everything through the lens of evolution and they attribute godlike qualities to evolution. Evolution did this, evolution created this. They even use the creation language when they talk about evolution. And I just find that extremely interesting. Well, um... I find it interesting, but I think I can understand it. We all, because we're human, have a tendency to fall in love with our creations. Mm -hmm. And over the years, over the years, uh, there's been so little, let me say, there's been, there's been so little change in real understanding of first principles. And what I mean by that is every professor who writes a new book tries to in invent a new language. But if you get through all the word salad, I'll call it word salad, of all the different books, and go back to first principles, hadn't much changed in the last 2,000 years. And so what happens is they invent something, and I'm, I'm not blaming them. I, I, I would be just like them if I were in that environment, perhaps. They invent something that's called theory, and they just, and, and since one, all the subsequent work is based upon a theory, they have a hard time accepting the fact that it's theory and not fact. So it gets so so instantiated, if that's the right word, into their being. And like all people, you know, we all, I'm, I'm fortunate, I've been retired 25 years, so I'm away from my ego being tied up with my job. Uh, if our livelihood and our ego is tied up with our job, there's a lot of incentive to keep things kind of calm. <laughs> gotcha. It's back to you, I'm sorry. Well, I was gonna say, um... Could you give me an example of some book that was written where someone's coming up with their own theory, but it actually just goes back to first principles? Or could you explain to me what you're talking about when you're, I think it's a very interesting idea. I just don't quite understand the picture, the, okay. the, the idea of first principles and then the ideas that spring out of that. Okay, here's a perfectly good example of something that's happening right today. Jonathan, uh, I'm sorry, um, John Verveke uh, has, has a really capable, quality uh, uh, AI researcher and uh, psychology professor. You know, he's a, he, he was right there at the University of Toronto with JP. Mm -hmm. um, he's come up with this idea of needing a new religion. And if you listen to him very carefully, his... Eastern thought is very, very much like Christianity as I listen to it. So what's he done? He's created a, a new set of lingo, some new words that talks about uh, relevance realization and meaning crisis and all of those new words, which are not any different than were talked about by Carl Jung and, and uh, some of those older uh, writers. Yeah. That's, so, that's, so, so that's what I'm saying. 
Okay, well, when, when you talked about the first principles, um, just flesh that out for me. What are the first principles? Boy, now you're, gonna, now you're, you're really digging into my ignorance. <laughs> well, I'm just acknowledging, it might be. My own, I'm acknowledging my own in, ignorance because... Um, <laughs> well, let's think what a first principle might be in this life. Um, let's just think of uh, what might be a first principle in psychology. Uh, that might also tie into uh, to, uh, organic chemistry or, or biology. Uh, that first principle is that the being at whatever level seeks a more harmonious environment. And let me unpack that a little bit or go a little further down the rat hole or the rabbit hole. Um, I think it can be shown in the laboratory that if you take an individual cell, a petri dish or a group of cells, and introduce some kind of a stimulus that could be detrimental to the cell, that the cell will actually move to, mm -hmm. to maximize its comfort or maximize its probability for survival. And I think that kind of a principle as a first principle might roll right up to the human to the human and in for example in our ability to have a system that det detects a serpent automatically built e deep into us as a as an individual part that might be called a subpersonality that's a first principle it's there to protect there's something there in the being at this level of an accumulation of a huge number of cells that protects the being automatically much like if you wanted to call it a first principle in a cell, that cell is going to protect itself and in some way it moves away from the danger. Now that might not even be accurate. That might be something I dreamed of instead of red. <laughs> so. Well, so you're just talking about what are the basic principles that we, that we understand about just how the world operates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, I don't even know that that's a good example. Probably the person who could give us the best example would be, I think it's people I've heard, people who have been, had worked, oh, I know it's Jim Keller, who was interviewed by Lex Friedman not too recent, not too, too long ago. Yeah, uh, that was great. That was great. I, well, I think he said about uh, Elon Musk, that when you go to, to uh, deal with a person of Elon Musk uh, capability that, uh, and he, he somewhere in that interview said, that man can get to first principles faster than any individual I've ever dealt with or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. So maybe maybe if we could some way get a, an email to Keller, get him to describe what a first principle is, we might understand it, or maybe Elon. Well, I, I do think there's something about engineers, and, and you're an engineer, so um, I'm a you're, hacker. you're an electrical engineer. Now, my husband is a mechanic. My husband's training was in mechanical engineering, but now he works in in high tech. In um, he's done hubs and routers and telecommunication, and and now he's in Wi-Fi. So he's got this broad spectrum of, of background. But it's his mechanical engineering background that makes him get right down to the nub of something immediately. When he looks at a problem, he can zone right in on what is the underlying issue that's causing this problem. And it's because he looks at it from the mind of a mechanical engineer. He said that's one of the first things that they taught them as mechanical engineers is how do you ask the right questions to get to where the problem is. Where did he go to school, Karen? Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Oh, interesting. Hey, uh, yeah, now we're, we're running up on time, but I sure want you to talk about, the, about your art capability and that chaos okay. to, now, to order. I don't know. I don't know what your schedule is, Jay. I have no hard stop at the end, so. Oh, I don't have, you know, I'm a retired guy living by myself. My schedule is mine. Okay. So you want to talk about the art thing. If you let me pause for just a second, I can go get a series of photographs that maybe we can show. 
so I could talk about it from a set of photographs. Would that be helpful? Oh, that would be great. Okay, just give me a couple minutes to set that up and I'll put this on pause in the meantime. So Jay, we're going to do the art thing at another time because it's a little hard for me to get the file put together. But, um, but I do want to pursue some of your ideas about cosmology and science. And uh, so uh, I'll put the ball in your court and you go where you want to go. You're wanting me to show my ignorance. <laughs> it's, um, the, we're just sharing ideas here, just sharing thoughts. You know, you put it out there and, and uh, it may spark something for somebody else. Okay, let, let's, uh, let me kind of go to one of my basics. I'm uh, almost 79 years old. And I guess really all that means is I've got a lot of battle scars. <laughs> And, but it also means that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a realist. Uh, all of us humans, I'm sure you saw it in your parents and other loved ones. At some point in time, we seem to pass a threshold. And at that threshold, we, in, instead of from year to year being about the same uh, in life energy or, or physical capability or whatever, uh, we go on a downward slope. At least I've seen that in, in friends that have died and, and in my parents and all. So if I look at my family and my family situation, I don't know how many years I've got, but um, statistically, you know, 83 to 85 years old and I'm 70, almost 79. So I don't have a lot more time, but all that means is that I try to, uh, uh, use the time that I, I do have in as effective a way as, as I can figure out how to do it. And, and a lot of that has to do, perhaps a little bit too much of that, it has to do with selfishness of, of doing like what I want to do. Uh, so I find that I spend um, two to four hours a day in the wilderness, and I have for several years. And it's kind of amazing what you learn when you spend the time out there on a regular basis with the plants and the animals and and in places where you hear the wind and the water and the birds and nothing else, no horns, no cars. Because in this particular area that I live, which might actually be as far away from an interstate as you can get in the southeastern United States, so it's 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 like a little piece of uh, of uh, of real estate that's quite quite beautiful. Um, and I'll just say one little story about wilderness. That in thinking about uh, the Lord and thinking about um, creation and thinking about um, you know contemplating those big questions that we contemplate. Um, a few years back, I, I, as you know, I'm, a, I'm trying to learn how to be a photographer, and, and I must be getting a little better because people want me to take their pictures and they like the stuff I've done. In fact, over my shoulder there, you see the only picture of mine that's hung anywhere, and it's a three by five or three by four hand handmade copper plate that's been etched for color of a photo that I took on our local lake. And one of my best friends actually hammered that out and it was entered in a contest to hang in the governor's mansion here in Georgia. Fortunately, he lost because I got to buy the photo from him. So that's my one piece of art <clears throat> that's hanging. Yeah, I thought it was a painting. <clears throat> No, it's it's actually uh, a fairly it's a piece of copper, and he, the man who did it is a real artist. He's also an engineer, and he all of his life he wanted to have a a forge, so he could do blacksmithing and make beautiful art and beautiful things out of metal. And so he retired and moved up here to the mountains, and 
he and his wife have this beautiful place, uh, several acres out in the woods. And he built this long building and her, she's on one end, she's a world-class master potter. Her stuff's collected all over the world. And he, he is, ab is able to fulfill his childhood dream of being a, a, a work in iron. And um, so anyway, this, this, is, this was an experimental work for him. He, um, he was able to get the colors by using different kinds of chemicals and dipping, dipping the metal in those chemicals to get the color. Mm -hmm. uh, and the original shot was made in, in the infrared. I don't know whether you've ever done infrared photography or not. No. But you can do false color in infrared sometimes and get a spectrum that's totally different than you can get in the, uh, in the visible spectrum. And in particular, uh, if you want to spend the time and really go for something uh, unusual, you can, can, uh, can take infrared. All infrared can be either converted into false color or it can be, con it can be converted into black and white. And some of the most stunning uh, photos you can get of clouds in the sky can be captured in infrared and then processed uh, and then processed properly. So at any rate, uh, I, I feel so fortunate to have this piece of art, and it's probably the only thing I've got that's worth a bunch of money, <laughs> except for my cameras and lenses. <laughs> but anyway. Um, so you were talking about being in the wilderness and what you learned from that. Oh, I wanted to say, I've tried to photograph moss. And there is a, there is a, there is a, a I, I guess it's an aura, would might be the best way to describe it, from some of the mosses here in, in the Southern Appalachian, that it occurs after a rain, especially if it's been a long, a long dry season, and then we get rain. And I have tried to capture that on film. It is impossible, just absolutely impossible. You cannot get, or I cannot get, with the best, I mean, my equipment is professional equipment, you know, many thousands of dollars for a camera, and really high quality lenses. And I cannot capture that uh, the essence of the moss. And so I've just, found, I've just finally given up on it. And then I read somewhere last year that it's been discovered that the plants in the, uh, in the woods, they, they have, a, they have um, an electromagnetic uh, uh, transmission. If you want to think of it from our modern engineering standpoint, you could say it's a language of the plants if you wanted to think about it from a more spiritual standpoint. But these, it's been measured that, that in the frequency spectrum in the 30 kHz range, and, and our ears are only good for maybe 15 to 20 K, at my age probably 15 K, but it's been determined that these plants actually put off these higher frequency sounds as a distress signal that they want rain. And so I have not been able to capture their essence on film. And I also have this feeling when I walk in the woods sometimes that I can hear them. It's not conscious sound, it's just a feeling. You know, it's like a spiritual, if I wanted to get woo woo, I'd say it's like a, you know, it's like a, a transcendental or a trans, it's, it's like a feeling, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, that comes back in, you've probably talked to people who, as massage therapists or as, uh, you know, some other people who claim to be able to see auras and claim to be able to have spiritual, have, in their meditations, have spiritual experiences that others don't seem to be able to have. Mm -hmm. It might be that they are able to tune into frequency spectra that are higher than the frequency spectra that most humans can tune into. And again, I think if you drew out a spectrum of the whole spectrum that's available compared to just what we can sense, we can sense nothing compared to, to what's out there. And so when people are talking about seeing the spectra of some particular uh, element, 
or they're looking at the at, at the path of Higgs boson from some collision that's been made in the in the large uh, in the in the particle accelerators. They're not actually seeing those things at all. They're seeing a representation of those things that have been made through electrical circuits in sensors that are that are sensing the quantum. And I kind of sit back and laugh when I hear that because I, it, since in quantum theory, you can't separate the, uh, the observer from the observed. How in the world could they know what they're really looking at if they've got an observer in there working at the quantum level? So I kind of sit back and laugh when I hear them talk about that. Anyway, I'm, I know I'm getting skeptical and critical, but so excuse me if I, I'm going too far. <laughs> No, no, no. I mean, isn't that the way that all advances in science have been made? I mean, you, uh, people have to ask questions. We might not know the answers, and maybe nobody knows the answers, but, but at least if you have the questions, you have some direction to head. So um, one of the things I was going to say about the woods that I, I read an article a few months back that somebody sent me or maybe i just stumbled on it that was it was actually in a science magazine I mean, a very um, respected science magazine and it was talking about the all of the the root habitats of all the plants in the forest and that each plant actually sends out signals to the other plants to tell what it needs they send out little chemical signals and those little chemical signals tell, you know, they need a certain, they need a certain nutrient that they're not getting. And so another plant of another kind will actually let that nutrient down into the soil so that that soil will be available for the other plant. Wow. <laughs> talk about woo, but that's actually a thing which they've discovered recently. So, well, I mean, I don't know how recently. But, but, um, and you can add to that then this discovery that I read about about signals being detected from plants in distress in the thirty k hertz range. Well, you've run across Rupert Sheldrake in your researches, right? Yes, but I, you know I've I've seen so many I'd have to go back and refresh. Well, one of the things Rupert Rupert Sheldrake is one of the first guys I ever heard from about this idea that the constants are not really constant. <laughs> um, he wrote a book about the ten the ten big myths in science, and that's one of them that the constants are not really constant. Um, and a lot of them are not actually myths, but they're just sort of places where questions aren't really being asked where they should be being asked. And he had this idea that our thinking is not just inside our brain, that thoughts actually have, um, have a vector, have a trajectory. And so he was talking about a lot, a lot of research that had been done on uh, taking for example, taking policemen or other people who track, you know, like detectives who will track somebody else for a living. In their training, they're often taught, don't look at the person's back when you're following them. Look at their feet. Because if you look at their back, they'll be able to sense your eyes on their back. If you look at their feet, their feet are hitting the ground all the time so they don't feel the sensation as strongly. <laughs> and so he decided to do some research on that. And the way he decided to do the research was with dogs. So in his research, he decided to look into whether or not a dog knows that its owner is going to come home. Because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that dogs will go sit by the door just before the owner comes home. But how... How, when do they actually make that decision to go sit by the door? Is it when they hear the car coming into the driveway? Or is it at some time prior to that? So he did this research that had cameras in the home looking at the dog and cameras following the owner. And following the owner 
at the point that the owner decided to go home from their shopping trip, they were supposed to signal the cameraman, okay, this is the point, I'm deciding to go home now. When that decision was made, the dog would go to the door. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, we, he has we all mentioned. kinds of good stuff like that. Well, you know, you mentioned anecdotal compared to uh, scientific study and, and, and uh, truth, the, the truth of the authority. This current uh, nonsense that we're going through on the COVID-19 is a perfect example that um, it might be that anecdotal might be more accurate than scientific laboratory study. Yeah, because if something is an unpopular idea, it, it gets squashed pretty quickly. I don't know how much more time we have. My soapbox on that is vitamin D. I think vitamin D is very, very important to take in order to um, make yourself as strong as possible so that you're not vulnerable to COVID. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and nobody's talking about that. It's not being widely publicized. I think that should be education on every TV channel, you know? Hey, there's even more than than that. Um, have you have you have you ever followed this uh, guy called Doc, this Dr. Schmidt up in Michigan? No. He is an expert on supplements, and uh, I mean, like 30, 40 years, and um, it is. Uh, you go look at some of his stuff, Care. You'll be amazed. Well, the reason I thought of that, you, you mentioned vitamin D. One of the things I learned from him was that, that there's this company that makes products. It's, it's a company up in, up in the Midwest somewhere. And they ra they've got a large farm and they raise their stuff themselves. And so they know the purity of what goes into their product that actually uses lung tissue from, I think it's bovine lung, lung tissue. And you can take a pill with every meal, and it actually strengthens the. Um, it, it actually allows new, new, new. The theory is that it allows new tissue to be grown in the lung. So, in addition to increasing my vitamin D, I ordered one of those bottle, a bottle of those supplements, and there's another local remedy that turns out to be very popular. It's called elderberry. Yeah, I heard about elderberry. Man, I could I won't tell you the whole story, but it really works. And it works so well that uh, the price went up a whole lot buying elderberry on Amazon. You so anyway, it, it yeah. works as a preventative, you mean? Uh, it works, it, it's curative. Hmm. The tree grows all over the world in this latitude. So right here in this in this in the Great Smokies or in the uh, I guess I'm really in the Blue Ridge rather than the Smokies, but here in the Blue Ridge and it grows in Europe and and I actually buy the berries in bulk uh, and then make the tea and I I had some results that were just absolutely amazing okay? because I've had respiratory allergy problems my whole life and I can honestly say that sitting here now taking uh, on the supplement on the supplement regimen I'm on, that my overall health is better at 79 than it was when I was 40. Wow! And especially my, young, my especially my lung health. It's just I, I I can't believe that. It might also be because I I don't know who knows, but whatever it is, my doctor says keep doing it. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's really that's exciting to hear. I'll look into that. Yeah, his name is um, uh, Darren Schmidt, S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Cool. Yeah, so um, how, how are things in your neck of the woods with COVID? Are people, um, has there been much illness there? Uh, almost none. Um, and we actually didn't close down here except a lot of the businesses did, you know, the retail shops, but, and the churches, of course, closed, but, um, you know, it, 
as soon as as soon as Georgia officially officially opened up, uh, we had the same traffic here in town, which is we have two stoplights in town. So if we have more than four or five cars at a stoplight, that's a traffic jam. <laughs> By the way, Karen, it would be one hell of a coincidence, but uh, I think I might have looked at property in your neighborhood back in the 70s. Really? I had an opportunity to move to uh, California. Uh-huh. And I had an opportunity to look either in the Bay Area or in uh, Los Angeles. And I chose Los Angeles, and, but I looked all around where I suspect you might live. Wouldn't it be a coincidence if I actually saw your house or <laughs> looked at your house? <laughs> well, it was there then because this house was built in 58. So, <laughs> Well, see, I don't really believe there's any coincidences in this world anymore. Do you remember the name of the town you were looking in? I was living in Los Gatos. Oh, well, I'm in Los Altos. Los Altos, okay. Yeah, yeah, Los Gatos is a beautiful town, though. Yeah. It's, I ended Los, up, Los Gatos is one of the few towns in the Bay Area that actually feels kind of like home to me because it's more like a, it has more of the feeling of a Midwestern town, has a little square in the middle of the town, and it has, uh, has a village feel to the downtown area and uh, a lot of older homes. So very, very charming town. Yeah, this was in 78, so that's been a long time. Yeah, that was before California was even a gleam in my eye because I didn't get here until 1990. Did you grow up in Ames? No, I went to, um, I went to university in Ames. I went to Ames for my master's degree. Now, my second wife was from Ames, so I spent a lot of time there. We were married for 10 years. That's a beautiful town, too. I really enjoyed being there for my master's degree. Yeah. Now, I was born in Alaska. What part? At, uh, in Fairbanks. Oh, yeah. Been there, done that. And then when I was eight months old, we moved back to Minnesota. Lived in the Minneapolis area until I was three. And then my dad got transferred to Colorado. So we were in Colorado for a year. Then my dad got transferred to Germany. And because the family couldn't go over right at that time, um, my mom and my brother and I, we moved into a one room motel in the town where my grandma lived, um, just so that we would be near family while dad was in Germany. And so then after, after he'd been there for a year, then he called us to come over. So we got on board the, I think it was called the, the Queen Mary, and wow. we, we took the ship over there. Were you a military kid? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I have had a lot, you know, just as an aside, uh, I spent a lot of time with the military. They were my best customers for many, many years, and some real close military friends over the years. It's a very interesting life. Um, yeah, I have some good memories, some bad memories. <laughs> but my dad retired from the military when I was nine. By that time, we were living in Maine. And uh, you at Lauren? Uh, South Portland. Okay. And then we moved to, well, we were in North Dakota for a short time, and then we moved to Minnesota. And I spent the rest of my growing up years in a small town in Minnesota called Princeton, about 50 miles north of Minneapolis. Hmm. I don't know Minnesota too well. Yeah. Well, it's quite beautiful. Lots of lakes and rivers. And uh, as a kid, I can remember there was a river just outside of the town where we lived. And uh, there was a big old tree that had fallen across the river. And I could crawl out on that tree and sit on that tree and watch the river going by underneath me. <laughs> you know, those were the days you could run around and do anything you wanted to. You know, you weren't confined to your house or even to your yard. When you were a kid, you could pretty much go anywhere. So it was great growing up that way. Yeah. I spend a little bit of time in Denver nowadays. I, uh, my lady friend and I who've uh, been friends for like 10 years. She lives in Denver. 
she's moved there to play grandma. And uh, so we, we, we kind of go back and forth a little bit, not a whole lot. So how is it in Denver with the COVID? Oh, she, uh, she's a basket case. Uh, she, uh, uh, she's, she's having, she's staying in. She lives, she's not right downtown. She's out in, in, in uh, one of the, the nicer urban areas, but you know, it's high population density and so they stay in. And so uh, she's looking forward to, uh, to getting out. Well, we're in one of the counties that shut down first in the country because um, our county was a hot spot in the very beginning. But from what I understand from the medical professionals now, there's you know so so few illnesses now that the hospitals are kind of wanting more business. But but we're still shut down, even though some other counties in the state have opened up. Our county is still shut down. So we're pretty much homebound too. My husband and daughter are both working at home and we do go out and get our coffee at Starbucks once a day though, <laughs> or, or Pete's. We order online and then we go pick up and that's our big outing. <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. I'll tell you something, Jay. One of the things that I've tried to, I don't know if you saw the video that I did where I talked about um how jordan peterson kind of describes this kind of an event and what he thinks comes out of this kind of an event um i if if not i can send you the link it's it's in the uh, video on the ouroboros and it's at minute 47 i start talking about it i would appreciate you sending me the link yeah because one of the things that um, when Jordan Peterson talks about it, I, I could just very quickly read you one sentence from here. He says, uh, a truly unexpected event sequence upsets the implicit assumptions upon which the original particular fantasy was predicated. And this consequence requires the paralysis of the old model inversion of otherwise stably maintained affects to competition and chaos and exploration guided reconstruction of order is it's actually a longer much longer passage but the general idea is that when you have a unexpected event sequence like this and it's in his chapter on anomaly which was the, one of the things i found most fascinating in maps of meaning was this whole idea of anomaly because it fits in with this chaos thing that I do with art. You, you introduce the anomaly and the introduction of the anomaly actually provides for more creativity. Can you send me a link to that chapter or do you know the chapter oh, number? Oh, sure, because yeah. I have, the, I have the book. It's page 256. Well, I don't have the hard copy. I have the uh, electronic copy and a PDF. Okay, it's chapter four. Chapter four, okay. Yeah, and it's about, I don't know, 15 pages, 15 pages into chapter four. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. He has a, a whole section on, uh, it's that particular paragraph starts, every society shares a moral viewpoint. But um, yeah, I can send you a photograph of the page too. But anyway, the, my point was in talking about that, that I know that there are a lot of theories going on about what's actually happening. And there's conspiracy theories, and there's people angry on this side, and people angry on that side, and there's anger everywhere. But I'm trying to hold all of that loosely and look at what is the treasure that's hiding in that darkness? What's, where, is, where are the treasures hidden in the chaos? <clears throat> And I think at every level of reality, going all the way down from the from <clears throat> the global perspective all the way down to the individual perspective, that there are treasures to be found. And so that's what I've been trying to look for. Okay, that's a what perfect. Have people, what have people discovered that 
that they didn't know before? What are people finding joy in that they didn't find joy in before? Where are they finding gratitude that they didn't have before? Where are they discovering areas of humility that they didn't even know they were capable of before? You know, so that's what I, I'm kind of looking for that stuff. To me, that's the interesting part of this. I'm aware of all the pain and suffering and horror out there and and that and maybe part of the reason I look for these other things is because I need to avoid all that stuff. Maybe it's my own fear, I don't know. But but I find it really encouraging to talk to people and ask them, you know, what are the good things that are happening for you right now? What are you learning? That's a beautiful segue into something that I wanted to get into with you. Cool. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that drew me to you, Karen, and why I reached out to you was an observation. Well, it was really an observation of how your mind works that I saw in your various, in two or three of your videos, and then I looked at more of them. And in particular, it was this inquiring, the thing you're inquiring into right now, in a way it was that. And looking for a subset because I think the whole problem is so large that because what you're really talking about is how do you solve the problems of society that have been coming along for thousands of years and one event and, and some results that come out of one event. So I, I can't even that might be a level of thinking that I can't even get to because I just can't grasp. And that might be your artist's brain compared to my electrical engineer's brain. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of down at one little subset of that, that I saw that the combination of, of your skill set and my skill set might be able to discover something that could be helpful, uh, to us and maybe helpful to other people. But I felt like it was important to reach out and at least start the exploration to, just to see what might come out of it. And Sure, what's the subset? So uh, the subset, I, I guess you could summarize most clearly the subset as a definition of what is it that happened between Sam Harris and Jordan Peterson that two intelligent, highly capable people who really had extremely good intent to want to make progress, totally flunked out and missed one another. What was it about the communications between those two, of those two frames that were completely different frames of the world, and they were trying to make those frames sync in some way so that they could have an effective, a better understanding of, uh, of the universe, or, you know, in the grossest, in the largest sense of the term. So I just kind of scratched my head as I watched those people interact. And, and in some cases, I was sitting back laughing. I was laughing at, at both of them, really, because I said, from my understanding of, uh, of the Lord and of, of Christ and of the Christian message and, and where it all fits, I kind of laughed and said they're never going to get there because neither one of them have a broad enough perspective to be able to consider the uh, the Christian story in their presuppositions of all of their life. So that's why they're totally missing one another. And so then I started thinking and I started talking to some of my pastor friends about, hey, there's a real problem. You guys are losing people in your congregations at record rates. And you know, you can go all the way back to Nietzsche and start to talk about why that's happened in, in the West. And so I started talking to local pastor friends. And there's one of the nice things about being in the woods all the time is I run into so many interesting people. And one of the uh, pastors in the local, one of the local churches here in town, I run into him in the woods and he and I talk for 15 minutes and, <laughs> and he's got a good sense of humor. So anyway, uh, so 
very specifically, I thought if there's some way that we could, you know, that we could come up with a frame or a language or a definition set or a tool set or a movie or a video or something that could let these two disparate worldviews have some kind of a knowledge of something that could allow the men to better interact with one another. And, and a particular application of that would be maybe a set of tools that the, that the modern day preacher could have, like the Paul Vander Clay or like my local preachers here that, I, that I'm talking with, a tool set that could allow them to have better communication with these young people that are walking away in, at, at record rates. So if I, so, so if I look at, at what I would like to spend my, if, 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 if there's a worthwhile project for me to spend my remaining years, as few as they are, uh, I think it would be a worthwhile, it would be worthwhile for the, for all of us. Anyway, that's kind of my story. And, and so, uh, so, are you thinking of are you thinking of some sort of a bridge between science and faith, or are you um, thinking about an overlay of science upon faith, or um, well, let me back up. What did you think was the thing that was keeping those two from communicating? What did I think that, that kept Peterson and and, and yeah. Um, yeah, what was the glitch? Well, the, the glitch was that they're both highly intelligent, highly motivated, highly good people, if you want to use that term good. Uh, what, uh, Sam wanting to... to uh, understand how to live happier and, and, and help people do that in his books and in his desire, honest, honest, uh, you know, honest intent. In Jordan, having a, also an honest intent and, and, and wanting to, I mean, look at 12 Rules for Life. That was, I, I bought that book the day it came out and gave it to my grandson. And he'll never understand it because he's, but he'll understand it when he's 18 and 20 and, and he's like 12 right now, you know? So, so they just missed each other because of all that's in their backgrounds that, that, that led to their frame. But I think there's a subset of people in, in Sam's frame and in Jordan's frame and in Eric Weinstein's frame and, and in, uh, Hell, just look at Weinstein had that prostitute, or had, not prostitute, that's, I'm sorry I said that, that's totally inaccurate. Uh, she's a, a porn uh, sex work. she does movies, she does porn movies. Weinstein had her on there, which was uh, one of his most excellent uh, talks, I thought, because it, it showed, it showed, uh, uh, a real desire on his part and a real desire on her part to communicate their realism to the rest of the world and to explain why they were trying to help bridge the gap among different frames so that people could live better together, perhaps. So I don't know. I don't know that I've answered your question because it's, it's, it's really, if you, if you start digging into it, there's probably an, a different answer to that question a different one for the conversation that would be had between every two people because every frame's different. Well, I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of simple-minded in a lot of ways. So there's there's certain things that are my that are part of my frame that are fairly simple ideas. And when I listened to I didn't listen to the whole debate because I found it way too painful, but I have listened to the portions that Paul Vanderclay had on his, you know, analysis videos. Um, it seemed to me that Sam Harris was not listening. I mean, he just, he wasn't listening. He, he was completely disinterested in anything that Jordan Peterson would have to say. 
because he was starting from the assumption that Jordan Peterson was somehow buying into this God thing that Sam Harris finds to be so very, very dangerous. So Sam Harris has a big X up there. Stop, don't talk about God. God is, you know, God is bad. We're not gonna talk about God. And so anytime God comes up, his ears just, you know, like that. Um, now, the simple part of my mind says, I can listen to anybody from any background because I have this assumption that truth can be found anywhere. There's truth sprinkled all throughout every religion. There's truth sprinkled all throughout every, you know, theory. There's little bits of truth, not, not the whole truth. And there may be some error mixed in there that's messed things up so bad and corrupted it that it's, it is kind of dangerous, but there's, there's some truth in there somewhere. And when you're listening to people, those little bits of truth will kind of pop out and shine a little bit. And, um, and those are the places that I think we can make connections with people. I mean, it's like that thing I read from Ravi Zacharias's background. He's always looking for the places he can, con he was always looking for places he could connect with people where they were holding some truth that was valuable to them. And the thing is to try to find the truth in what they're believing. And, and I think that goes back to what you were talking about. A, a set of tools requires that sort of ability to listen to each other and grant good intentions. Could I add one thing to what you just said? Absolutely. Going back to the first statement you made about Sam not listening to uh, Jordan. Mm -hmm. Could it be that because of Sam's frame, and because of his strength of character and his strength of belief that he wasn't able to listen to Jordan, even with all the strength, even with all the good intentions of wanting to. Well, is that strength of character? I mean, I would think that strong character would say, I'm confident enough in what I believe that I don't have to protect myself from bad ideas. If, if I know what I believe and I'm confident in it, I can hear someone else's ideas. And even if they're bad ideas, they're not gonna influence me because I'm confident. I, I'm not afraid, so. Well, it's hard to crawl into anybody's mind. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. I'm just so, saying, from from my observation of it, it looked to me like he wasn't listening. Now, probably Jordan Peterson honestly, also wasn't listening. I think, he wanted to, I think he wanted to listen very badly, but wasn't able to. And I think this goes back to what I was saying earlier about built into the human built beings at a psychological level when we, is this protective mechanism that his, his going into, into Jungian kind of, uh, analysis or thought and now this might not even be accurate that little part within him that is his protector mm -hmm. probably was saying you better not listen to this guy because it's gonna hurt so bad don't listen to this guy understand what I'm saying yeah yeah yep so there was a it was that's the fear right well, it, it, it's, it, it, he doesn't, it's not fear from his standpoint. It's his internal monitor that protects him from hurt was saying, hey, this is really dangerous. This is really dangerous. Best way to protect ourselves is not to listen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, contrast that. Contrast that. If you want to really, really study the human psyche, Go back and look at the last interview that uh, John Verveke had with, uh, who was it? It was just last week. Oh, Paul Vanderclay. Go back and look at the last Jordan, uh, Paul Vanderclay, uh, Verveke 
uh, conversation. And, and, and it is just so apparent that Paul Van de Klee is going to convert John. And John knows it. And John is trying his best to, John has his little internal fear protector, or is it under better control than Sam had, has? And this is, you know, amateur psychoanalysis and just my total BS, but that's the way I see it. Well, if that, if, so we're working on this subset. So if we've come to the place with this subset that the problem is the, the serpent detector, <laughs> I'm not sure we can come up with a set of tools that will find its way past that. Um, be, because, you know, part of my own project has been to come up with, for me, a, a, a picture of a set of universal principles that are good at the that are just as good at the quantum level as they are at the cosmos level and not only in the physical universe but they're also good at the psychological level and they're also good at the relational level because to in my mind truth is truth and and i think truth actually has a truth has a structure i guess would be the way i would put it and truth is composed of truth hmm <laughs> It's, it's very hard. I mean, finding language for this stuff is very hard. But I see this set of principles that seems to govern everything. And it shows up everywhere. And, and so um, because of that, I could, let's say I could find the language for it and I could write the book. It's not going to convince the Sam Harris. I mean, he's, it's not going to get to him now it might it might speak to some young person who's out there looking for some truth but then again maybe not you know people are very complicated and very interesting and very curious and god has god has a way of meeting people where they are and giving them what they need <laughs> You were saying earlier that you you were conflicted because you thought sometimes that you were just doing the things that you wanted to do and you felt kind of guilty about that. And I struggle with that sometimes too, but I part of me also comes to the conclusion there's a reason I am the way I am and there's a reason I'm interested in the things I'm interested in and there's a reason you are the way you are and why you're interested in what you're interested in. and there's a reason why you're so compelled to follow that trail. Um May I propose something to you? Sure. What you just described as coming up with a set of principles mm -hmm. that could allow folks of different frames to reach a universal truth. Yeah. It's not any different than what I described. Right. So I, th I think, I think that I don't know yet what your set of principles is yet. <laughs> So I don't know. I don't know if there's any overlap, but um. well, I would say this. And what you probably saw from my email a few days ago that I was going quiet for thirty days with my group. Yeah. Um, and that's because the hardest part of the problem is defining the problem. Mm -hmm. I say I that it might not be the hardest part, but it's a very hard part. And I would also say that we can't know everything. That life is not long enough for any of us to know everything. So just like Jordan has taught us in, in, in several of his lectures, the first thing we have to do is focus. 
before we can can do anything we have to focus so yeah. what i saw in you was that set of skills of trying to uh, uh, i think you described it as you consulted at one time as an intercultural linguistics consultant is that the way you described it well my background was linguistics but i i was an intercultural consultant working on mainly on business theory and business practices to train people of other cultures how to interact in the american business community so what i thought when you said you didn't say it in that much detail but what i thought a skill set that you might have that's unique what that might be an overlapping skill set that in some way might be applied to this problem of how to get people to talk with one another how to get people to recognize truth etc cetera, etc cetera, was the combination of the ability to bring beauty out of chaos combined with the ability to work with people of different cultures, languages, whatever, so that they could communicate better with one another. I saw those as unique skills that I haven't seen in any other individual. I'm not saying that other individuals don't have it, I've just not seen it. Well, it's always interesting to hear stuff like that because I never think of myself as having any set of unique skills. Well, you might not, but that's just what I saw. <laughs> well, so just to, to wind up for today, because I know we've gone on for two hours now, so, um, oh so to wind up for today, I'll just tell a little brief story, and, and this might help you some with your project, I'm not sure. When I was working as an intercultural consultant, I was working for a group called Clark Consulting Group, and... Um, Mr. Clark, I can't even remember his first name anymore. He was very, very well known in this arena. And we actually had people coming from all over the world to our group who wanted to intern for free just so they could work with this guy. And he had designed this little tool that he called the DIE. And the DIE was describe, interpret, and then evaluate. And the idea was when you're working cross-culturally with somebody who has a different point of view and they tell you something, and I'll give you an example. We, we were at the time working with Japanese employees of Procter & Gamble. They would come over in groups of 12. We would train them for 18 weeks and then they would go back to Japan and work with Procter & Gamble in Japan. One of them came in one day and he said, Americans are just filthy. <laughs> so, so instead of defending or, you know, trying to prove him wrong or defend ourselves or whatever, we say to him, oh, that's really interesting. Can you describe what it was that happened that made you come to that conclusion? Well, yes, I was, I was doing my law. I went down to do my laundry and there was an, one of the people in the apartment complex there, they had two washing machines full of dirty laundry. And he said, oh, well, that, that's interesting. Um, could you describe a little bit more why that upset you? Because there's more than two laundry machines in that room, so you still had plenty of room for your laundry. And he's, oh yeah, I had plenty of room for my laundry. So, but the reason that, that upset me is that two laundry, two washing machines well that means that they've been storing up laundry in their closet for a week that's just disgusting <laughs> so so now that we know what the problem is and what their frame is right then we can explain oh well you see in japan people have very very small washing machines that only fit enough clothes for each day and so they wash their laundry every day and they hang it on the balcony and because of that they have their laundry done up all the time they never have any laundry sitting around but in the united states we have large capacity washing machines we're concerned about saving water and so we do our laundry once a week oh Problem solved, right? Until you know what the problem is, you don't know how to find a solution for it. 
And most of the time we don't know what the problem is because we don't listen long enough to find out. Amen. <laughs> Can I ask you one more question before we stop? Oh, sure. And I, I think I read somewhere or heard somebody say that as a result of the biblical series that Jordan did, mm -hmm. that there was a new religion that was popping up. It was called Christian Atheist. Have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard people say that, but I think most of those people that started out calling themselves Christian atheists eventually sort of became Christian agnostics and then sort of became Christians. So I don't know. I've so talked like, to quite a few people who, who listening to that biblical series caused them to start searching. And once you start searching, if you're really looking for truth, you're going to find it. Okay, now here's the, here, so, so, Here's the problem, Karen. You hit the nail on the head. You've got to define the problem first. Or as an engineer and a project manager, which I did for a while, you got to come up with a project plan. So you've got to know what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and where you're going to get your materials. And you got to define what's the problem. What kind of bridge am I trying to build? Mm -hmm. And, that, and you've got to do that before you start. And, and you've got to identify uh, the materials and the people that can do the different jobs. And we, I could tell you some stories about that throughout my career that you, you would just laugh because you're such a linguistic expert. You would, you would, you would just laugh when I told you the stories. So anyway, let me, let me go on. So, it seems to me the first phase is to try to identify the problem try, and try to find out. And here's the, pro, here's, here's the crux of the problem, Karen. Here in the West, the truth, and I think that this is, I, I have no question about this being the truth, because you can define truth in all kinds of ways, you know. Uh, Jordan and, and Sam went around this, but the truth is Christianity for Judeo-Western society. And the reason, and the thing that separates Christianity away from other religious uh, approaches is, is the idea of love. And what brought me back, and I will be the first to say that I was agnostic for many years, but what, what, what I learned from Peterson that brought me back and brought me back with a strength that is almost impossible to describe was the idea that, that you really do have to look at the Bible as a series of, uh, of archetypal, archetypal stories and that I think you said to me in an email something about the truth of Genesis 1, the, the scientific truth. Well, it, it's actually deeper than what you've exposed to me, that, that, why you think that, that, we, that, that, that if we go for, forward and try to define, et cetera, et cetera, I'll introduce you to that, to that body of knowledge. And, and it's, it's so far out that uh, but it but I think it's something that might uh, and, and I, I'm rambling I'm sorry so the problem is that us Christians who have seen the truth and who understand the truth of the scriptures and and of the way of life and and and, and all those stories you can't go out and talk to somebody whose life is built around another set of of, of pre presuppositions and experiences. So tied, tied together with, with identifying the problem of how to, to do a communications gap between you know, the engineers or the scientists and the theologians is, is tied together with that is how do you come up with a message that is, that is really, really true that the people who want to know about the message 
the youngsters that are that are in their schools and are that are in their telephones and that are that are seeing the secular ways in a in a that's being presented to them primarily by by the atheist media that's the first story you've got to come up with something that that these people will look at and not reject because those young minds are a whole lot smarter than us adults want to give them credit for and and the and the way the current theologians try not all but but here here in the bible belt i'd, I'd say it's universal i've visited many many of the of the churches their message is all the same and it's rooted in uh 19th century dogma and it's what they know what they're taught in seminary and, and what they do very very well for their flock that's declining so a key part of, 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 of what I think, you know, I'll end up working on one way or another is, is some way to, uh, to see if, if there, there's something that could add to the solution to that problem. So anyway, I, I know I've rambled and I really apologize for that. Oh, it's, that's okay. Before we go, I wanted to just ask you, have you read any Dallas Willard? No, I haven't, but I heard somebody talk, I think, Somebody talking about that. Oh, it was. Yeah. Um, you oh, might it was wanna, you. You might just even you might just want to look him up on Wikipedia. It probably has a has a or or on the Stanford. Um, I think Stanford has a Encyclopedia of Philosophers or something. You might just want to look him up. Okay. But yeah. He was a, a. I believe he was mentored by Ed Edmund Edwin Husserl phenomenologist and um, his thinking is very very interesting when you look when you think about from Jordan Peterson's perspective as well the pastor of our church is kind of a devoted follower of um, Dallas Willard's teachings and I see a lot of connections between the preaching that our pastor does and a lot of things that Jordan Peterson talks about. So um, I think there's some threads to follow there. So Dallas Willard would be a good one for you to look up. I'll do that. This it's is been a great pleasure. day. I hope we can talk again sometime. Well, we can certainly email back and forth. Uh, I, I, I didn't, you know, one of the things that might come out of this might be a novel. Uh, I've got a real close friend of many many years who um, has been trying to get me to collaborate with him for many years he's a successful novelist and an epidemiologist really really fine fellow and i just had an email from him this morning wanting more information on what we might do unfortunately like me he's old and we don't have as much energy as we used to have so and and i'm not a writer it's it's not something that I that comes easy to me. I have to really work at it. So anyway, um, well, I'm going to send you, I'm going to send you the link to that Jordan Peterson thing on on COVID nineteen, even though it was written in nineteen ninety nine. Okay, <laughs> and, please uh, do. I'll send you the link to that, and maybe you can share it with your novelist friend because when I look at it, it looks to me like it would make a great novel because so much potential is there for a world changing paradigm but obviously looking at the leaders we have today that's not going to happen but it could <laughs> you know in an alternate universe it could this could be the beginning of something grand really really grand so and you know i think scott adams is going to be a key player yeah i agree well we got to go, but I will, uh, I'll get back in touch with you and I'll send you some links and I'll- Yeah, you can publish this if you want. I, you don't have to send it to me for approval. Okay, okay, sounds good. I, and I, I'll, I can't I'll, imagine- I'll try to link up, if there's some things you want to link up to in the description part, um, send me the links. Uh, I'm, prob I'm so tired right now, Karen. I don't know okay. when you would publish <laughs> this. Uh, if you're gonna do it in the next two days, I probably wouldn't have the energy to, <laughs> to get it to you. Okay, well, I'll just put in, put in there what we talked about, and that'll probably be enough then. Good it's a meeting pleasure you meeting you. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.
how do you turn